Welcome to the second of our RSC uh, public seminars for Michaelmas term 2020. I'm Associate Professor Tom Scott Smith, um, and it's uh, a great pleasure to introduce Simon Turner, who's going to be our speaker for tonight. Simon is Associate Professor at the Saxo Institute at the University of Copenhagen. Um, he's a social anthropologist who's a specialist in migration and who's produced a great body of work on refugees and camps in particular over the last decade. Um, a series of fascinating books and articles, which um, if you're a student on our MSc course, you will certainly be reading some of over the coming weeks. And Simon has been particularly at the forefront of moves to question simplistic theoretical accounts of the refugee camp, um, seeing refugee camps purely as uh, technologies of power and control and encouraging us to look at them more ethnographically. In particular, um, he's written a fantastic article um, looking at definitions of the refugee camp called What is the Refugee Camp, which is published in the Journal of Refugee Studies. Um, his detailed monograph, which was published in 2010 called The Politics of Innocence is really a fantastic uh, read. And uh, more recently, he's been working on this idea of stuckness and connectedness and carceral junctions. Earlier this year, he had an edited collection called Reflections on Life in Ghettos, Camps and Prisons. And this is the theme on which he's going to be speaking to us tonight in a talk called Carceral Junctions, Stuckness and Connectedness in Camps. So it's a great pleasure to have you here, Simon. Um, I'm really looking forward to your talk. Anybody who's listening, if you'd like to ask a question, then please click on the box at the very bottom of your screen and you can enter in a question there at any time during the presentation. And then at the end, I will field those questions and pass them on to Simon in our Q&A. Over to you, Simon. Thank you very much, Tom, for the kind words. I'll just, there's some technical stuff here. I have to share my screen, see if it's gonna work, all that stuff, there it is. Okay, so it's a great pleasure to be here, although I'm really sad that I can't be there really. Uh, going to Oxford is always uh, a pleasure, coming from somewhere like Denmark to go to little Harry Potter land, to drink beer in a smelly pub afterwards and so on. This, this is the kind of pleasures we don't have, but I guess it's also better in terms of not traveling so much as we have done before, and also having more attendances to our webinars than is possible if it's a physical one. So. That's fine. I just another <clears throat> small caveat. I have a slight fever today and it's not COVID. So I might be a bit strange in the way I'm talking, but um, a couple of um, headache pills might have helped on that. So what I'll be trying to talk about today is this very broad thing that Tom mentioned is to try to understand the paradoxes of camps. The fact that camps are both sites of immobility and sites of mobility. Um, they're both sites of bare life and sites of politics or agency, if we want. They're places that you can see as social death, but also places of new opportunities. And I'm trying to sort of grasp this duality. I guess this is something I've been doing since um, for the last couple of decades almost, and I still don't have the solution. And as Tom rightly mentioned, my recent project has been on where we propose this concept of carceral junctions, this sort of paradoxical thing of being both carceral and a junction. And I must mention, this is not my invention solely. I'm working together with Zachary White, uh, Katrina Suplicou and Cecilia Jacobson on this project, where we try to follow it in different contexts. Um, and then finally, I'll try in my presentation, my 30 minutes here, to um, link this to issues of time in terms of both stuckness, the fact that being stuck in time might be more important than being stuck in space. Uh, this is linked to the stuff I've done on stuckness with uh, Andrew Jefferson and Stefan Jensen, but also um, some other stuff I've been working on in relation to future making and anticipation and hope. So can we somehow see, is this a way of understanding whether you're stuck or not in a camp? The fact that you have can see a future, not in the camp, but somewhere else. So my argument 
to get to start off with it rather than try to conclude with it is that we have to see the camp both as a castle and a junction and that maybe this idea of being able to imagine a future elsewhere is central to the question of whether um, stuckness is existential or not or the sense of such stuckness is so uh, so this is a common view of a refugee camp. This is actually the one where I did my PhD ages ago. And it's the bird's eye view. And we see it very much as this sort of sticks out in the landscape as a sore thumb. Um, it has order, it has straight lines. It has the clear demarcation of what's inside and what's outside. And it signals control, it signals immobility, it signals stuckness. And um, I can't help mentioning Agamben, uh, although lots of people do it and people are getting sick of it. But I think in many ways, this is also the Gambonesque view of the camp as the nomos of our time, as he calls it, and refugees as bare life. And the reason I'm mentioning is with how he has um, inspired a lot of um, scholarship on trying to understand camps. Um, People have been inspired by him, but there's also been quite a strong critique of him, especially from a more ethnographic, more field-based point of view. Uh, we have people like Eric Katz, who's not an ethnographer, but she talks about between bare life and everyday life. We have Nando Sigona, who proposes the concept of campsonship. And then we have people like Adam Ramadan, who talks about resistance and political agency in the camps where he did his um, Work. And this is also something that that um, that I found in the camp. And I'll just sort of quickly go a bit up through some of the sort of ethnography, because you can also see a camp from the other point of view. You can see it from the pedestrian point of view, um, and then you see that the camp is full of footpaths crisscrossing, um, meandering out of the camp. The fact that the camp is not closed onto itself. People also move inside and outside. They go to collect wood. They trade with Tanzanians, they sell their labor to, this is, sorry, context of Tanzania, it could be anywhere else. Um, but this idea that there is this moving in and out of the camp. Um, they used to cross the border, uh, the border in order to smuggle coffee or beer or to join the rebellion back home. So the camp is at once this isolated container of holding matter out of place and deeply connected to the outside world. Um, also inside the camp, we don't, we don't see people simply becoming bare life, becoming passive victims, but the camp generates agency, generates possibilities. Um, and I, I found that specifically, especially a group of young men were what I became, liminal, I called, became um, liminal experts, the liminality of the camp, the camp, the fact that the camp was this strange place that didn't have it, the kind of structure they were used to actually created possibilities for them to become something else than they would otherwise have been. It created opportunities to um, certain groups of uh, men, but also uh, quite a, a large amount of women. The camp was also heavily politicized. You couldn't go anywhere in the camp. You couldn't do anything in the camp without it being part of the political struggles between two factions. And this was very concrete politics in terms of two political rebel movements, but also politicized in a broader sense that everything was up for negotiation. Nothing was given, nothing was taken for granted. Um, what you saw in the camp was also that you would have the kind of, I'll just go back to my first slide, because the kind of undifferentiated space that we have here, the kind of planned space organized by the UNHCR and, and the Danish architect who had, who had drawn it, was challenged by the fact that, um, I'll just see if I can get this thing to work. The camp became differentiated. There were places of wealth and places of poverty. So the area around here, right close to where the, the organizations were, people were wealthier. And it was also a safer place. Down here, close to the bush, close to where robbers could come, was seen as unsafe. There was also conflict between this part of the camp and that part of the camp, belonging to two different political parties. So despite the fact that they were all given the same set of you know, pots and pans and plastic sheeting, within a very short time, some had sold their plastic sheeting and were living in 
grass uh, huts, while others bought lots of it, and they also started building bricks and so on. And although officially they might be registered one place, they would buy another place to live. So my research assistant uh, officially lived one place, but um, also was somewhere else and could take two food rations as well. So it's just to say, show that the camp is much more than the kind of space that um, we see if we look at it from the bird's eye view, and also if we see it from a sort of Agamben-esque idea of just being a place of control. But what I also try to say, and this is, yeah, it's an old point I've written elsewhere, but the point is that um, I think that some of the critique of Agamben is also um, misunderstood in the sense that they, they try to make an, uh, an empirical argument against a philosophical argument. So Agamben's point is philosophical and they're trying to say, oh, but look here, in, if you go in there and look, look in the camp, it's actually different, which is one thing. But I also think it's the problem is it's, um, there's a danger of creating some kind of idealized agency or heroic resistance in the camp, which is something I guess maybe because of my um, continental background, uh, we have a thing against agency. We don't really like that. Um, I think in the Anglo-Saxon world, it might be slightly different. But what I try to show then is not that there is this, there's one hand the camp as produced by UNHCR and NGOs. And on the other hand, you have resistance coming from below from the refugees. I'm trying to show that the camp itself creates political subjectivities. It is the depoliticization of the camp that at the same time creates a hyper-politicized space. So it's 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 not a, a resistance kind of thing. Um, it's something that's produced um, by the camp itself. And this is where I think that maybe the, the idea of castle junctions might somehow help us understand camps because they are at once sites of incarceration and junctions that connect and enable mobility, I tr we try to argue. So the camps themselves have this double nature. Um, I'll get to some of the examples um, shortly. Because, uh, how can a camp be a junction, you might ask? Um, and to see the camps also as both, and we use the term carceral rather than confinement, and we can always discuss whether that's a sensible thing to do. But carceral is somehow punishing. It is someone who does it to someone else and has adverse effects on that person. Uh, so these are we're looking at camps in the sense of camps put up by states, by agencies. And so we're not looking at summer camps or other kinds of voluntary built camps. And of course, we can discuss camps like the Gurugu, I think it's called, or in, in northern Morocco or the camps in Greece and so on that are spontaneous and built by the refugees, but are still the product of border regimes. And they, they might, we might say well, they, these are not actually voluntary, they're pro the product of state uh, power. And so, and, and then also when we talk about carceral junctions, we talk about them as being both immobile and mobile. Um, that they, they create um, stuckness, but they also create the possibility to move. Very often people would jump from one camp to the other. And also at a broader level, we're trying to look at the fact, try to get away from this idea that mobility per se is liberating, immobility is the opposite. So this idea that because you can't move physically, you're stuck existentially. And if you do move, it is somehow liberating. I think there are lots of examples to, to go against this idea. So the idea of carcerality is inspired by um, carceral geographers such as uh, Moran, Jill, Turner, others who have been working with um, as from a ge geograph as a geographers looking at imprisonment and carcerality, but also broadening it out to looking at uh, other kinds of encampment and closure. Um, I just got lost in my notes here. Yeah, so um, one point that they make quite nicely, th th these geographers, is that we cannot, again, assume that 
carcerality and immobility are the same. They show that, for instance, in prisons, movement can itself be a way of incarcerating, a way of dominating, a way of controlling. The fact that people have to move from one part of the prison to the other, they move from one prison to the other, that can also be carceral. So trying to question the idea that carcerality is always related to not moving physically and then the opposite is moving uh, physically. And so the main point is that, that um, for ge carceral geography is that power works through this kind of control of mobility and immobility. Um, sorry, I just got a bit stuck there. Okay, so if we look at the other concept of that we're trying to work with is, is the junction. Um, an idea being that um, there is always a movement of bodies, hopes, rationalities, ideas going through the camps. Um, Michel Lagier talks about the Carrefour as the, you know, the junction itself, as a place where different types of people meet each other and therefore new subjectivities emerge. Um, and this might be a way out of going, going beyond this idealized idea of agency, showing that subjectivities emerge in the camp due to them being these kinds of uh, junctions. Um, so this kind of tension between, on the one hand, being carceral and the other hand being a junction between closure and openness creates, we argue, some kinds of cracks and possibilities in the camp, possibilities to create something new, to have new kinds of political subjectivity. So we play around with the idea of a junction. I mean, <laughs> sort of the, the actual, and it's always very difficult to take these kind of pictures too far because then you, you get stuck. But if we look at it as like a traffic junction, you know, and this is why I have put this map in. If you notice, there are no, no arrows going, they're not all going towards Europe. But again, to illustrate the fact that camps can be stepping stones, camps are places between which people move. Um, if we look at it as a junction, um, on the one hand, a junction is a place where the traveler stops up, ponders and takes his or her bearings you know, before making the next move. And we saw this in 2015. We saw how migrants use camps as stepping stones, how they would go from one to the next and then they would all reorient themselves, think where to go next. I'm not saying that this was an easy move, was anything that was just like, but the, the camps became these places between which one could move. Another way of looking at the camp as a junction is this idea of the Carrefour, of an interface. Um, when I did my fieldwork in, in Le Corde camp in, in, in Tanzania, they talked about how the way that they had learned a lot from other nationalities. So the fact that they were Burundians with Rwandans, they felt that they had learned some tricks, how to survive, how to deal with things from being with them. And I also very clearly observed how they had learned from interacting with um, humanitarian agencies, how especially these young men would learn the lingo of NGOs and UNHCR. And in that sense, this junction between refugees and the people working there created some new possibilities uh, uh, in the camp itself. And we can have see all sorts of um, interfaces and they can be at the sort of, and again, that's where the traffic thing sort of stops because one thing is for Rwandans and Burundians to cross, but there's also interfaces at different levels. So you'd have the state bureaucracy or, or like the Geneva bureaucracy of the UNHCR at one level, and then you have the staff working on the ground. There's a junction there between two kinds of, of ways of acting in the camp. Um, you would have the junction between the managers of the camp and the inhabitants of the camp. And then a whole lot of other people who also enter the camp. You have volunteers. This is very widespread in Denmark. You have all these people who want to help the refugees by giving them teddy bears and, and microwave ovens or whatever they want. You have advocates working for them. You have neighbors. You have journalists. And they're all entering the camp at different levels and these junctions emerge. We also have a more sort of overall as you know, abstract junction between, at least in our part of the world, between the welfare state 
and migration law, which might be pulling in a very different uh, direction. So for us, when we look at junctions, it's both this way of looking at stepping stones, the way that people can move from A to B to C, but also what happens in the interface in the junction. And I'll try to talk, say something a bit about time because both confinement and or carcerality and junctions are seen very much as spatial and these are geographers also working with them. And we, it's very easy to imagine the camp spatially, use these kinds of maps of it. And it is also what defines it in many ways. But maybe we should also look at it in terms of time. And um, in English, you have the concept from prisons of doing time. So there is something about time in carceral spaces that's important. And there has been quite a big uh, amount of research on what's called weighthood in, for instance, uh, refugee camps. So this idea of what happens in terms of time once people are stuck. So you can be stuck in space, but you can also be stuck in time. And the interesting thing about refugee camps, um, as opposed to many other, no, anyway, the interesting thing about refugee camps is the fact that they are temporary. Um, they may become quasi-permanent, we've seen this happening, but by definition, they are seen as temporary. There's not something, it's not somewhere you're supposed to stay forever. And it's not one of the three durable solutions, repatriation, resettlement, or local integration. There's no space for the camp. In these durable solutions. And at the same time, they, they just go on and on, some of these camps, for decades. And that's where you get this paradoxical concept by UNHCR and others called protracted refugee crisis. I mean, a crisis is per definition temporary, emergency situation, and then it's protracted. So you get this doubleness into it. Um, And if you talk to refugees in the camps, they very often portray um, the camps as time on standby. So they talk about, we feel that we're left behind. We feel that we're losing out. So this idea that time rolls on back home and everywhere else, but we're sort of stuck. There's a, there's a, we're not part of the normal flow of time. And what's worse, of course, is this fact that nobody knows when it end, will end. There's, that's why some people talk about sort of indeterminate temporariness. So it's not temporariness that you know it's temporary, it's going to happen, it's going to last for three months and it's over. It's we never know when it's going to be over. Um, so in terms of existential immobility and a sense of stuckness, time might be worse than space in that sense. This kind of, a, and I think what I'm trying to get at is this, I kind of, I, inability to plan a future uh, or even to see a future um, is, is, is probably the worst thing about the camp. And that's probably defining whether you, what happens in a camp is, can you see any other kind of future than the one that you're in? Um, so this ability or not to propel oneself towards a future is quite important. Um, And this leads me to explore hope, because I think this is a way of imagining a better future. But let's first start with Bourdieu. Because he argues that to anticipate is to assess the forthcoming, avenir, coming towards us in a pre-reflexive manner. He talks about to having, a, having a sense for the game, to see the ball where it's going to be even before it's there. This kind of thing is part of your habitus um, and your habitus has to be in line with the game. You have to know the game in order to predict the future. This is something he talks very much. He's very much concerned with um, reproduction of things and not so much with change, I think. Um, and that's where you might ask then, what happens when one cannot predict this future, when the game changes? We, know, we don't no longer know what the, this is about and therefore we cannot position ourselves in the right position vis-a-vis -vis the ball, for instance. And this is where someone like Gassen Hage, who draws on Bourdieu, 
talks about the fact that this is when we lose our place in the world. We suffer social death, he says. Um, however, we might also have a bit more positive approach to this and with the risk of being too positive, um, that this kind of uncertainty, this not knowing what the future will bring, um, this kind of not knowing the game, it's a new game you're in, um, may produce something new. And, and this is where hope is a means to anticipate futures in such a situation. And there have been a lot of studies, again, in the last decade or so in anthropology, looking at um, what happens in, un in cases of uncertainty, unpred unpredictability, and so on, and how people use hope as a way to maneuver and navigate in situations like this. I should be right. I think I'm, I managed time-wise. So just very shortly, a bit about hope is that um, someone like Janssen and stuff, Janssen talks about transitive hope vis-a-vis -vis intransitive hope. And I think others have done the same. With transitive hope is like, I hope my asylum claim will go through next month. And intransitive hope, which is the one we're more interested in here, is I'm hopeful that the future will be better. Um, I found this when I did some fieldwork in Nairobi among clandestine or irregular, whatever you're going to call them, refugees. Um, they were very Christian and they all had this idea of hope. They, their, their situation was really dire. They had nothing where they were, but they had this hope and they believed that Nairobi was the place to be for this kind of hope to be able to come towards them if they stood the right place at the right time. But it was all guesswork. Um, Of course, there's a danger using this idea of, uh, of hope because the first, of, the first one is this idea that anthropologists project their own sort of delusion ideas and fantasies of fluidity and indeterminacy into the field. This, you know, we like that everything that's fluid and indeterminate uh, more than stuff that is strict and regulated. And that's, I think, is a danger in some of these approaches. Another danger um, using concepts such as hope is to sort of feed into a neoliberal discourse that you know, people can be in marginal, precarious situations, they structurally can be in impossible situations, but they still have hope, they still have agency, they still have resilience. So you can actually get away with putting them in these nasty camps because they will still have hope. I think that's, that's a danger of it. And I've tried to, in my recent work, I sort of tried to counter this to some degree by looking at the concept of anxiety. So now you're sort of following my trajectory of what I've been looking at recently. And anxiety, I argue, is the other side, the flip side of the same coin as hope. Because they're both about anticipating futures in times of uncertainty, adversity. But whereas one is positive, um, is it Bloch calls to call it militant optimism? You know, that we, we have to be optimistic despite everything. The other one is negative. You fear that things are going to go wrong. But they're both about trying to predict the future in a situation where it's very unpredictable. Um, I think this is about the ambiguous nature of the camps. On the one hand, they may seriously challenge the ability to see a future of any kind, but they do not prevent it completely. And through hope and anxiety, uh, those who inhabit the camp are able to imagine futures and act accordingly. And that sense, they sort of avoid social death and gain some kind of agency, now I use the word. Um, just to sum up, and I'll read my summary because then it's more precise, I think. So in this presentation, I have tried in very general terms to investigate what makes up a camp and to push some of our understandings of the camp, challenging common assumptions on the relationship between human mobility and agency, as well as its opposite between confinement and social death. By adding a temporal aspect, we are perhaps better equipped to understand the confining aspects of camps. It is the temporary nature of camps and the fact that we are permanently temporary, that they are permanently temporary, that makes them difficult places to live in. Time in this sense is time to come. What will happen in the future? Will I be able to move on? Will I get my permit or not? It is the future that matters and agency lies in these anticipations of these unknown futures. Through hope and anxiety, refugees and migrants try to navigate and act in the present, however bad their present is. 
Furthermore, I propose the ideas of camps as carceral junctions because camps are places that incarcerate. They stop movement, they isolate and separate, but they also bring people together in new constellations, what Agir has called carrefour, junctions. And they function as junctions in the sense of turning points or stepping stones, places where one's journey might take a turn. In this sense, I've tried to overcome the distinction between camps as structures and refugees as agency and explore how camps can produce both stasis and movement. Thank you. Thank you very much, Simon.